Welcome to the Writers of the Lost Zord uh, podcast. I'm Shigeru Joe. I'm Nanami Chad. Isamu. This is Andy. And today we're talking about, we're going to be talking about Kamen Rider Kiva. Keep with the Halloween spirit because that is, as of this recording, Sunday, four days away. Uh, and we're only going to be talking about the first, about ten episodes of Kiva given that it's a full 50 episode series and we don't always 48. have the time you know what i mean we yeah. don't always have the time to binge it as soon as we can right that's like what a 3 days out of our day out of our busy busy life week mhm but kiva to me starts out off as one of the most weakest and most pathetic writers Oh, yeah, that that's what turned me off about this character. He was the wimpiest guy ever. I can't like, breathe the air or else I'll explode. Shinji Ikari would tell him to nut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know that's true. Yeah. But in those, even in those first few episodes, he gets some good development. In- yeah, he just needs some, some outward, an outward push. From other Maybe people. With kicking the ass. That too. Um, in, in these first few episodes, we really get... It, it's mostly getting introduced to the world of Kiva and how things work. We get introduced to the opponents for this series, the Fangire, which are stained glass motif vampire animal things that are also people that are immortal. Like, they can die and come back. And they... Instead of white walking up and sucking people's blood, they summon fangs out of nowhere to suck the color out of people and leave them transparent husks wearing clothes because Japan. And right. one of the most interesting things about Kiva and what personally to me makes it one of the better series, we not only have the story of common writer Kiva, we have the story of his father being played out at the same time in 1986. Yes. And it, it, the show jumps between these 1986 segments and 2008 constantly. And at first it is jarring and hard to understand. It's quite disorienting. But after about five episodes, you really start to understand it. And as early as episode one, you see parallels happening between the past and the present happening at the same rate. Now, these parallels are just coincidence, but it builds on the theme of the immortality of the Fangire and the actions of the past deeply affecting the present. Like, uh, in the first episode, that the spider Fangire uh, rips, uh, tear, uh, scratches Scrapies the door. The one wooden door. And then, and, oh, that's that spider fangire just he 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 is a hardy mother. Uh, mm. I I honestly love the his design so much. Yeah. Like as the first monster that you see in a series, it's supposed to make a big impact. Yeah, on how it's supposed to on how you're supposed to proceed the rest of the series. And yeah. I feel like this spider finger does the perfect job of doing that. Aside from the fact that all the Fangire look amazing, if the heavy black tones and the stained glass designs on them, especially with their eyes, and how within the eyes you can see a reflection of the their like human disguise, it's yeah. it's just wonderful design it, choices. It, it kind of reminds me of the Orphanox from Fies. I actually have not. The what? The what now? Orphanox. They're the they're the monsters of Fies. Pretty much, they would they, um they show up, and their human disguise would show up in their shadow, on the oh. wall or something. That sounds interesting. Well, you know, limited stuff. You couldn't. You really can't have a 
technical stuff that I don't really know how to explain. Oh, I know a lot of crazy stuff happens in Fives with the Orphanox. Especially that done there, of course, Orphanox. Right, but let's try to keep this to Kiva. Yeah, I know. So, Kiva, he's kind of like, I don't know, would you call him Van Helsing of Kamen Rider? Hmm. If we were going to go with a monster movie, or at least paranormal thing, I would call him the Castlevania-style alu- a vampire that yeah. for vampire. Oh, yeah, that makes a better better parallel. That That's that's more like his his uh, secondary writer, Ixa. Oh, big face. I love Ixa suit so much. Oh, yeah, it's, it's the entire thing of a shining knight. It's very Literally. sexy. Like... I love Ixa so much, I get frustrated with him, just because the things he does is so good, but they're so annoying. Especially when he up in Jack's Kiva's Garuru Saber. Oh, yeah. He only does that once throughout the entire series, and never does it again. I I, I think there's a reason he did it, because he scares the piss out of water. It's like, hey, that's mine. Well, it's mine now, so you're gonna have to deal with it. And uh, we should talk about, like, Wataru and the forms that we see in these first few episodes. Like, we see him, his transformation in Kiva, which is obviously vampire bat themed and is just a beautiful rider suit. I know, it. this is what I... And it's uh, <laughs> interesting that you don't really see it with many other riders with uh, one of the legs being different than the other. Yes, the um, asymmetrical leg design, which is the reason that they stopped using his basic suit come the end of it, because that chain on his leg was an actual iron chain, and it was too heavy for the suit actor. So by the time they got his final form, he requested that they just go straight into that since moving and doing stunts with that um, heavy chain around his leg was, you know, hard to do. And I think it was like 10, 15 pounds. Yeah. I mean, and when the Kiva's fighting style is agility-based, that's going. It, that's really kind of hard to keep up with. It's only very agility and light footwork. It's a lot of grapples and throws and low to the ground. It's animalist. Oh, I definitely agree with that. Especially depending on which form he's on is in two is more yeah. I, I especially I, with I, Garu the Garu's form, it's just like yeah. holy shit. He's honestly, practically a wolf man. That when Wataru transforms into Kiva, it is his fangire side taking hold and fury and fighting like a feral animal. That's why you, you don't often hear Wataru speaking in Kiva form. He does, but it's very, it, especially early on, it rarely happens. And then when he uses the arms, the person who has who is that monster goes into him and I kind of think takes over to a degree. Yeah, I can kind of see it. And uh, the first one we see, it's like, Episode four or five is Goruru Saber. Four. Okay. I got the wiki up, so I'm helping. A amazing, <laughs> I, I do too. <laughs> like one handed, um, single edged sword, and it is an. Um, I, I love the fighting style with it. Again, it's down low. It's very quick, broad, sweeping strokes. And whenever it hits something, it, spar- it makes sparkle sounds. And he, uh, his finisher, he, he, uh, bite, bites the sword with his belt. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he puts so it in his mouth, and then just kicks them and slashes them at the same time. Like, it's really cool, but it's really dumb. But okay. nothing, nothing is as cool as Kiva's original writer. Yeah, it's just it's a, the whole Kiva taking off the chain and the whole wings sprouting out of it. And getting an eclipse in the middle of the day in a giant bloody red moon. Yeah, and nobody else questions this. It's like, why I, is this all of a sudden say, nighttime? Do you think some dude is in his apartment waking up and he sees it turn nighttime? It's like, oh, nope, never mind. Go back to bed. Most or likely, it's guy having lunch with his girlfriend. Like, what the fuck is going on? Most most likely, it's just like a radio thing. It probably is like maybe twenty meters. Anything in twenty meter range only sees that. So. 
I like Kiva is one of the more quote unquote magical writers, so he can kind of do what he wants, and you know, reality and rules can take a backseat to it. Um, I know we see Basha Magnum near the end of the first ten episodes, right? Was it nine? It is uh, uh, episode six. Oh, I'm off. Yeah, two episodes after Garulu. Oh, Garulu. I can't Yaru! Think, of <laughs> think of Gabumon's ev- Digivolution, Garuruman. Yeah, I mean, oh, it, even, it even looks like it, except yeah. for the horn. Well, I, I think that's based yeah. on Japanese wolf or something, because it comes up too often in yeah. uh, shows like this. But uh, Basha Magnum is... It, it's the um, creature, creature of the, the Black, Black Lagoon. Yeah. Yeah. Not a merman. No. They, some people say that's hand in hand, but they're very different things. And this is a very, very quick um, uh, form that looks like it doesn't even move. He just glides along the top of the grass that he's on, like he's dancing on top of water while shooting little bubbles out of his gun. And he pretty much becomes a sprinkler, too. Yeah. Like, I personally think Basha Magnum is the weakest out of the monster arms, but that's just because it's the gun one, and I like to see him getting up and hitting things. Uh, hitting things is fun. I also, I really love the Doga the dog Hammer. And that happens a little bit later, unfortunately. 14. Yeah. And Episode the, 14. The, the monster for Doga, that guy is so funny. Uh, but the, um, I, I really love the Otoya-san. <laughs> Otoya... Otoya might be the best part about Kiva for the first 30 plus episodes. And this isn't to knock Wataru, it's just Otoya's fun. Right, he's dead. Yeah, he, 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 doesn't really, he doesn't really have a care in the world. All he wants to do is just play music. Really beautifully, by the way. Oh, yeah. I, mean... I still cannot tell if that's them who's learned how to play that one piece of music. Or it's them pretending like they're playing it, and they just added an ADR in post. It looks very mm. realistic as someone who actually has played a string instrument. <laughs> I, either way, it's great acting on their part, or oh great yeah, playing on their part. Because I think if you go through the whole series of Kiba, there are actually three violin pieces that they play. But uh, I, and they're so it's so beautiful too. Because I know it's at yeah. least two, but I can't remember if there's a third one that's slightly. I can't remember the epi- the episode, but it was the one with the uh, the one that was that fell in love with the music of his father. Oh, the uh, fangire that Ixa messes the crap up. Uh, who had the uh, black star violin? Yes. Right. And by the way, the 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 way that that Kiva senses out these other fangire is the uh, is his violin in this case that may belong to his dad they are they pretty much confirm that his yeah. dad made and oh, you're right away otoya's what if there's you a don't picture figure it out really quickly you might have some problems but yeah, his father, it didn't take me long to figure that out at all yeah his father made bloody rose this beautiful violin with like the slightest tint of a red stain and it will vibrate and it will make a high pitched note sound when a fangire is attacking and that that's and to, clue to go wreck shit. I think that and I also think only Watru can hear it. Is that a frequency that only he can hear? Is it that would make sense, but I just never like clue together. Yeah, because I believe while he was playing the violin to that one girl in the first episode, she's like, where are you going? And he just runs off. I okay. didn't even think she even heard the violin. That that would make sense, given stuff about Wataru. I mean, with him being... Part I mean, it's vampire. pretty obvious. I mean, just for, I he mean, had just the same markings. Markings. You see he's part Fangire, but I mean other things. That water and uh, and you also see. I mean, later on. I mean, I I'm really loving this series so far, and just like a lot of stuff later, I just like, holy crap! It's it's what it's like. There's like all these like 
oh, hey, it's you guys, the three that, like, that are the weapons and stuff. Why do you want to kill, why do you want to kill Wataru? Why did you make a promise to his dad? Yeah, oh, the, that those guys' names are good. Jiro, Roman, and Riki. They don't tell you what happened, any of the big things you want to know about the past until the very end. And oh my god, the shit that goes on at the end of the two thousand of the um nineteen eighty six arc is fucking crazy. Yeah, oh, I can tell. It, it looks fun. Like uh, I love, I, I I love how the characters are back then. You, I think the nineteen eighty six arc um story of Kiva has a much bigger cast because they not only have Otoya and um Yuri so Yuri. I can always I always forget her name, but they have them, the whole um, wonderful Blue Sky organization, and the monsters and the Fangire. Yeah, and in, with, yeah go ahead. And with the um, with uh, two thousand eight, we got Yuri's daughter Ma- Megumi, uh, mm-hmm. some gu- random guitarist, a puppeteer, and a whole mm-hmm. bunch of not really necessary people. Like, well, also, not really feel like we get Nago. And the Blue Sky organization from the current war- time. And yeah. you see a lot of, uh, if you follow Tokusatsu, you see a lot of familiar locations in the show, too. Well, that's all of mm-hmm. Toku Ryu's and things. Yeah. And I'm, by, by the way, the guy who plays Jiro was in another one, another Kamen Rider series, as a Kamen Rider. Um, Hibiki. He was one of the guitar guys. Was he Toradoki? Uh, yeah. Awesome. Because I've seen and I thought I recognized him. Yeah, he he was a total... T- t- yeah, that guy. The bassist, technically. Yeah. No. I thought Toro One of them was a bass, wasn't it? One, one of them was the bass, one of them was the lead guitarist. I think he was the lead guitarist. Uh, okay. It's hard to tell with their weapons what's a bass. It's more like positioning and stuff. Alright. But, um... I, I do like how they characterize the um, other um, monsters. Like, Jiro is very wolf-like. He's, he's that, a lone wolf. That's, that, yeah, Kinda. that's the easiest way to describe it. The dude he's is not, a wolf. He's very hunterish And concerned with getting his prey. And extremely cunning. And then and, you have... <clears throat> you have Roman, the creature of the Black Lagoon. Uh, the, Cute. Nah, nah, trap. Nah, nah. And um There's a trap. Yeah, oh it's and uh Riki, the Doga guy who's just <laughs> the the double entendres that come out of his mouth. <laughs> at, at one point you have to ask if he really knows what he's saying and he's doing it on purpose, or he's just that stupid. You can't tell. But I think you only get a little bit of him before the first part of Kiva really ends. Yeah. Uh, and you, I mean, there's a lot of good things about Kiva that I like. That I like in these first ten episodes. I mean, it is a little slow paced. It it's got a slow start, especially within those first three to four episodes. If you don't hate the series by the end of the first ten, you love it. I mean, it's so like, it's so like kind of mad, and then it's just like, oh my gosh, it like it got good. Well, that's what happens when you introduce a good rival writer. Uh, and the whole Ixa... aspect of the Ixa stuff in the past is completely different. Yeah, uh, and I, I absolutely <laughs> love Dirty when girl. a writer belt can be used by anybody. Yes. Oh, you, I can tell you how many people have have had that belt on. It's nine. No, eight. Uh, are eight you people. counting the movies? Not counting the movie. I have a... Yeah, we got Otoyo Kurenai from 1986, of course. We got Kisei Nago, Yuri Aso, Jiro, a, le- a guy coming th- that's going to be coming up later, Rook, Megumi Aso, Kengo Irate, and... Kengo, yes! I love Kengo. <laughs> and, oh. and Ryo Itoya. Ah, Kengo becomes Ixa, that is... I'm sorry if I... Kind of spoiled it for you. Not, oh, that makes that's not like much of a spoil. It's like making more hype. Like it doesn't tell hit her the context for what happens. Oh, okay. Well, okay, I guess, I guess it doesn't really count then. That really changes what's going on. Yeah, 
I mean, holy shit. I mean, I love Kengo just because he's just so... He's hyper, but, like, in a good way, like... Um, now that... Mm, mm. Did, did, hush, your, hush your mouth. Mm. Like, the Kiva belts, like Kiva and Dark Kiva, can be used by other people. It's just not recommended. It's going to hurt a lot. Uh, I, and that's all we're going to talk about on, you know... The Kiva belts be being passed around because spoilers. Yeah. Oh, big fat spoilers. Hmm. Um. Uh. I don't think we see Rook just in these first episodes because he's the first big antagonist, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't think he comes in until around fourteen or so. And um. yes, because that's where you get the bat start getting more of the backstory with the uh, Ixa driver. Yeah. Yeah. Like, see, a that, lot of it. See, that's how it sort of seems like to me. 1986 is Ixa's story. The, the belt itself. Mm-hmm. Well, 2008 is Kiva's story. Wataru himself. Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. Or at least the story of the belt and not the writer, because nah, there's there's a lot of writers. Oh. Ixa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As I said, the belt passed around like a dirty little whore. Of more than the bee. Young... Much more than the bee from Kabuto. Yeah, but that was funny because a lot of the bees just turned into funny, terrible people. Uh, a punch and kick hopper. 50% of the bees turned out to be gay. Huh? <laughs> hmm. um, I'm trying to think of other things that we can really cover for this first chunk of Kiva. Because this is mostly just introduction and world building. Yeah. And they they, they just expand more on the world building later because they don't want to tell you everything. Ooh. I want to go kind of more in detail on this writer kick just for a few seconds. It's, just like it's how it's, it's fucking... Like, it... Like, I don't think we brought this up, but uh, after he kicks, it's his fucking emblem. Yeah, he, on the kick. You don't, you don't he, really see that much with many writers. Uh, when he kicks the enemy... A imprint of his emblem either appears like on the wall behind him or on the ground like, as the impact site. It's not like oh, there's an just an explosion and a cracks in the ground. No, it's like a Dragon Ball Z explosion happened and his emblem is now three, four, maybe ten centimeters deep in the ground. Yeah, in a, about I don't know five meter radius around the guy that he just kicked. Oh, it, it looks big and beautiful. Yeah. Uh. And then you get to see Castle Doron eat somebody. And they explain what Castle Doron is and why he's eating them. And Is that the dragon? Yes. Yes. Okay, because I I still don't know what the fuck that thing is. uh, Try to think Um, of the ghost capture thing from uh, Ghostbusters. uh, It's not a big spoiler because you can figure this one out on your own. In the past... They do beat some Fangire, but they just turn into balls of light and fly away. Yeah, I remember that. When Castle Doron eats them, the um, Fangire cannot be revived. Oh, okay, okay. That is, uh, having Castle Doron or something else happen permanently kills a Fangire. Oh, that stuff. It's not love, is it? No. Okay, no. good, because that would just ruin the show for me. <laughs> well, I mean, there Uh-oh. is a lot of love going on in Kiva. I mean, if there's, like, a legitimate romance, but I just mean, oh, if they fall in love, you know, Oh, blah, there's blah, more blah, than blah. a le- Yeah. And a bit of a bromance, too. I'm hoping there's a bromance between Wataru and his guitar-playing friend. Oh, oh, the one that <laughs> happens with Nago is so much better. You know how many times they spend uh, bath time together? And in Japan, uh-huh. that's not weird. No, no, it's a little weird because it's a private bath, not a public bath. It's Wataru's uh, bathtub that Nago just lets himself into a come one point in the series. Okay, you have my interest even more, Pete. Like, they, they used to be the D-Boys together, an acting group, and now they D-Boys. I, I guess so. <laughs> Somebody like, really needs to Photoshop Dap Boy on, like, Wataru's face on okay. Dap Boy. But, like, the character development that happens with Mago later is so good, and I can't get into it yet. Yeah, that's for part two? Yeah. Whenever we would get to that? We'll probably just... Okay, that's that's good for me. Yeah, we're going to be doing ten episodes a week, 
just to make it a little bit easier to swallow. So basically, we just got to get through to episode 20 by next Wednesday. Yeah. That's two episodes a day, really. Like, well, less than, but... I mean, I'm already going to start 17, so I can have that down by Saturday. I I think that's about it for this first... Well, Um, how about... Anything to add to it? Oh, I can say that when I think of a bike-themed writer, I mean, a bike-themed superhero, well, at first I think Ghost Rider, but a close second is Kiva. Oh, with his design. Oh, we have not talked about his goddamn rider, his bike. He doesn't use uh, it that much yet. No, I, I think his first appearance is like the second episode, and then just it's just, just a thing. I've, I've just seen him ride it a, a couple of times. I haven't really seen it that much. And it's sad because it is a fucking custom Harley Davidson, and it is uh-huh. amazing. Like, it's a low rider. It is not a dirt bike. It is not a crotch rocket motorcycle. This is a low rider Harley. I mean, it kind of fits his character thing. It does. And it is beautiful. And I'm like, no. When you see its upgraded form, I hope you're as mad as I am. Well, the thing is, you can't really do much stunts with the chopper. I know. That's why they have the dirt bikes. Or or crotch rockets. I hate the dirt bikes. I'd rather have the... uh, motorcycle crock rocky. Yeah. But just have him drive fast and run down a fangire. That's all that's all I need to be happy. Yeah, the 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 motorcycle is called Machine Kiva. With two A's. Kiva with two A's. Um Yeah, it's that very creative. I might well, I need I need to bring something up. Well I want to ask about it, but it it might be a spoiler into next week's podcast. I can't remember exactly what episode the Ixaloader Came in eight, eight, around eight. I, I am not a fan of that. No, I actually like it. I mean, it's not horrible, but I mean, it's a it reminds, it's like a fucking like uh, Armor Borderlands thing. Or I, no, I'm thinking of uh, it's just like an like Earth Mover, you know, like a little um, like backhoe kind of thing, and it can throw like explosives. Well, I thought he was throwing. Ex- I think it was barrels or something. Explosive oh, barrels. Oh yeah, right. That thing. Yeah, the like powered Eekser. I don't like it. It's not bad. It just looks like. Well, we have a design for something, and we want to sell it as a toy. Okay, now put it in the show. Uh, I mean, it just contrasts because like Ix's armor is so cool looking. His weapon is cool looking. I like his bike. I like. Well, so far I've seen. One, three people use the armor. I like all three of the people I've seen use the armor, and it's just like that one thing stands out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Oh. I, I also like, love the fact that Deeksa in the past and present have two different forms because the visor isn't opened, and that's stuff that they haven't perfected in the past. Yeah, when that, when that thing opens, it's just the power of the sun being blasted yes. out towards anything that's I like there. the fireball finisher he has. The um, I can't think of the name of it. Ixa rising up. Yes, I just I, I don't know why this thing is cool. He just punches a fireball at him. Oh, he gets a few different finishers later, and there. Well, I've, I've yeah. seen the fireball, and I've seen you know the power of the sun, pretty much, where it's just like this beam of energy that comes out of his visor and it just completely destroyed the fangire. He gets an awesome sword and then, like, a super rapid-fire cell phone gun. Okay, I, I can get behind that if it's done right. Eh, don't okay. Don't really think that a cell phone should be a weapon. I mean... Well, look at the Note 7. But uh, boom. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we, should, we should shame you, but it's too good. I did what I can. <laughs> well, yeah the the weapons that he has is the Ixa Caliber and the X and the X Riser. Yeah, but you'll you'll we'll see them later. I'm kind of pissed off though about uh, uh, Jiro because, mm-hmm. like in the first episode, I don't know why I just got this feeling about him, and I was like, I'm gonna like this guy. I'm gonna like this character because he. You know, he just came in, and he was just, like, a commanding presence, and the thing with the coffee, 
and then you find out he could turn into a wolf, and he goes and fights that one fang guy, and just like wrestles the fuck out of him, and off screen, I'm because guessing he's an alpha. Kills him. But then he's he's a he's either a bad guy or an anti hero, and I'm just like motherfucker, because I just I was like this this is gonna be the guy, and um, I don't know. It just, He's it just, closer it, to an anti-hero than anything. I'm not going to give away anything, but he he's not bad. And I'm, I'm bad as an alignment. He, I'm trying to figure that, out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Everything that happens with Jiro is done exceptionally well, and he is a very good character arc with accepting the state of his species and understanding what he needs to do to help others. Instead of being a lone wolf and a vicious hunter, he become, gets more of a pack mentality with not only the other monsters, but with Yuri and um, Kurana. See, I'm trying to figure out if he really was Megumi's mom or if it's more of just, I need a woman to give me babies kind of thing. Because it's like right on the fence right now. Because I could see him actually caring about her, but I could also see him just wanting to repopulate his species. He, I'm not going to tell you if he actually loves her or not. I can say he does actually deeply care about her come later the series. I can kind of get that. I mean, this is after episode 10, and we'll touch more on this obviously next week. But he does just go up to Watori later and just say, hey, we need to team up to take this guy down because he's going to hurt her. Mm-hmm. And they just drop everything they're doing. They're like, okay, let's go kick his ass. Yes. So I can tell he at least cares about her somewhat. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I also like how the villains, like even just the Monster of the Week fangires, actually have more of a fleshed out motive. And, you know, like the and one that's standing out in my head. What's that? Like a method to their madness. Yeah, like, like just one that's standing out. Um, it was in the last. Well, let me go back a little bit. Um, there was the the one that had like the little sock puppets, and he kept wanting to find a wife. Oh god! And, yeah. yeah, in eighty six and two thousand eight, and you know, next I can talk more about this next week. I'll just say I like the fact that they do have more than a singular reason for doing what they're doing, and I haven't seen that in they- a lot of other shows. There is more of a reason that they're doing this that you will get to see more of later. But it's a a large part of it is their compulsions on their person and on their fangire side driving them to do this. Like to bring up the fangire that fell in love with Otoya's music. The reason that eventually has to die is because he cannot stand loud, distracting music that isn't beautiful. That got me right in the feels, too. And, like, he's a good person, but he throws a fit and starts attacking people because he can't stand the rock music. And it's not like he's a weak dude. He can kill all of those people if he loses it hard enough. And some fangire embrace this and just can become creepy stalkers grooming their secretaries to be their next meal and some Mm -hmm. fight against it. They, they they try and give a level of complexity to the Fangire that they did not need, and it was not necessary, but it was wholly... It was better for the show, and it made everything deeper. It made them more understanding of antagonists and as people. And the ones that weren't completely evil, it put an impact to their deaths. Hmm. Well said. Well, from what uh, Isamu has said, it does have... have it- it has put the show into a better light for me. For me, at best, this is kind of mediocre for me. Because, well, the thing is, I actually do like to have some, ma- not not necessarily major comedy, but some some laughs there. You know, in a, some of these tokusatsu, because remember, these are people fighting in spandex. Yes. I mean, and this is me coming right off of Dan O, the, the first ever they've ever seen. I can't. I hate Deno. I mean, Deno, Den, I think Deno was just too much comedy. And then Kiva, I will admit, it is a lot more drama and action focused. There's not that many jokes. Well, the one thing that got that got that did get me laughing a little bit, but I don't think it 
came up yet. It was the bath scene with Jiro and Otoya. Oh, oh god, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think I've seen that yet. Okay, so it's much later than that. Mm-hmm. Hype. A little bit of hype for those people that have not seen it. To the extent of the show, <laughs> I think some of the bigger jokes in it are, oh, Yuri's afraid of dogs. Oh, the dog just loves Otoya. That's about it. Oh, Jiro's a wolf, so he sniffs them. They're little pun and small little jokes. It's not like someone makes a funny joke and people laugh and it's a lighthearted moment. They're little drips of humor, not big jokes. And that's what makes it harder for some people to get into it because it is a lot more somber. It is a lot more drama-focused. Oh, just talking about jokes for a second, I'm actually glad I'm watching the um, TV Nihon download where oh. it kind of gives you little captions about, you know, stuff you may not understand. Then mm-hmm. I don't know if it was like a very subtle Kaneku Man joke or if it was just in general and the joke was also in Kaneku Man when... Um, oh, let me find his name. I'm sorry. Uh, Kiva's dad. Um, oh, what, yeah. oh, yeah. When he uses the Ixa armor and he powers down and like the next episode, they're all wondering why isn't he weak? You know, why didn't it hurt him? And uh, Megumi's mom is talking to the leader of the organization and she's like, well, maybe he's just too stupid to get hurt. <laughs> And I just, I, I really thought that was funny because, like, the way he acts and, and just that, I just really liked that joke. And, yeah, you know, it's kind of the same thing in Kaneki, man. They're like, you know, maybe he's just so strong and so good because he's too stupid to know any better. Honestly, knowing the, knowing the people who subbed it for Nihon, they're huge anime fans. They could have taken the original line and made it more of a joke like that. I mean, it worked in in that scene. It was just it was quite good in an otherwise fairly middle to serious episode, and you mm-hmm. know, just had that little lighthearted moment. And here's the problem with with what I saw, because I did not see the TV Nihon version. I saw the overtime subs version. Mm. So they're more more literal in their translation. Yes. I, th- so, I think with stuff like this, I lean more towards TV Nihon. I, personally, I always swing towards them, but I understand the need for overtime, especially with the way Nihon gets sometimes. Uh, the overuse of Japanese words that they think most people should know that not everyone does. Like when you say Orewan Tachi, do you guys have any idea what the fuck I'm talking about? Nope. Or nope. what it, uh, what's that in context? Jesse Orewa Tachi or Isamu Orewa Tachi. I might be saying this wrong. It be that would be Isamu and his friend. God damn it! I knew the Tachi part. Yes, Orewa I, I did not. Is referring to the person beforehand and the their group of friends. And Nihon uses that. They used it in the Deno subs a lot, and I think they used it in Blade once or twice. And they used, like, an extra suffix on it in one of the scenes. And I'm like, no, you motherfuckers. Not everyone understands Japanese like that. I don't understand a lot of Japanese, but I understand that from seeing in fan subs a lot. And seeing people put, like, TL notes. Hey, this is a common Japanese phrase, but you don't put that in your sub. Like, put, like, Isamu and his friends and then put up Oh, it is commonly said as ore wa tachi, if you really want to push it that far. That, that's the biggest complaint with them, and I hold them to it. You don't push the Japanese language that hard in it, although I, I do like how flowery they are with their text, which, it, which they do rewrite things to make it more uh, easily understandable. Like when, in Gokaiger, when I was talking to Joe, she says Joe San, and we see it as Joe San, not in other people that say Mr. Joe. That there's an inherent difference between the suffix San and the prefix Mr. Okay. So. Sorry, personal rant. Dude, personal rant by Isamu. Get, more, get used to that, people. It's probably going to happen in the future. Mm. <laughs> so, 
is this all we can say about Kiva as we stand now on ten episodes? I was gonna I say, think for now, I yes, think for me personally. Every- yeah, I think we we captured the big points of one through ten and glimpses of the future. Ooh, the eyes of the past. Oh, wait a minute! We forgot somebody to talk about. Kivat Bat the third. Oh, Kivat. Best henshin ever. Like, he's my favorite, like, henshin-y thing. He, he, I, I love Kivat. He's a so, little shit. I mean, he is a sentient being, right? He's yes. not just, like, part of the suit and he can just talk. I mean, he is alive, right? He has his yeah. own consciousness. Okay. Because I kind of yeah. thought he did, and I was like, well, I mean, he could just be part of Kiva that's just always there. Mm-hmm. Should I... Should I be bringing up the other, the others? They don't. They know the other key that exists just through marketing, but they don't. They don't know the context for which the other Kiva exists. Or yeah, he's, he's got. I would call them siblings. Mm, not relatives. Sibling, they're relative. Yeah, because it's. I'm not going to give it out. You'll see it later. Yeah, but yeah, that is. I think that's the everything about Kiva. Yeah, and and for some reason I thought that that um, whoever voiced Kivat also voiced uh, Steinbelt too. Steinbelt from Drive. I'm not sure about that. Uh, I know I, it is. They, they, they sound similar. They, they sound similar, but it's not the same guy. Just like with Ankh and that one guy from Geki Ranger. Oh. Yeah, he was a dragon oh. spirit guy. Yeah. Uh, the guy at the end of it, they kind of look alike, but no. No, they're not. But that the actor does make an appearance in Wizard. Right. All right. But, uh, oh, go ahead. So, yeah, this is it. That's all we can say about him. This was Riders of the Lost Sword with our feelings and thoughts on the first ten episodes of Common Rider Kiva. This was Isamu. Nami chan. This is Andy. And Shigeru Joe. We'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.